-hmm. Any other questions? Um, so after after 1610 or so after his death, how open was China to the Catholic Church? I mean, he was the first Western Western Catholic missionary. He wasn't. He was, he was the first in the what we might call late imperial era. In the Yuan Dynasty, there was a, a, a Franciscan named John of Monte Corvino, who actually, John of Monte Corvino in the 13th century was in what, what is now Beijing, um, used to be the capital of the Yuan Dynasty. Kublai Khan had Monte Corvino build a Catholic, Roman Catholic church in the Yuan Dynasty in the 13th century, next to, and I'll answer that question, next to Kublai Khan's palace. And John of Monte Corvino was the first Catholic bishop in China, 13th century, way before Ricci. And he went and got about 110 boys that were being sold, and, um, and they would have been certainly sold into, into slavery. And he purchased them and trained them as, to sing the, the chants of the, of the office. So um, Kublai Khan used to love to hear chant during the office and the church bells. So Kublai Khan would go kind of stand next to the Catholic Church in Beijing and listen to these Chinese boys singing in Latin. It's kind of interesting. And the eunuchs, by the way, learned how to play the clavichord because Ricci was sort of teaching some of the eunuchs how to play the clavichord. Um, so Ricci wasn't the first, but certainly he was, I would call him the father of the modern Chinese missions. And after he died, the next, his replaced, his, the next person who replaced him, uh, Niccolo Lombardo, was very zealous, a, a fan of Ricci. Some people say he wasn't, but he was. And um, he was a little too optimistic, I think, because after Ricci, you see the church in China have moments of support and moments of severe persecution. Um, and in my book that's coming out next year about the Catholic martyr saints in China, um, I, I outlined that history of martyrdom through the late imperial era. And there were, there were periods wherein martyrdom was rampant. And it should be also known that in the 20th century, there are more Catholic martyrs on earth than in the early church. When we think of martyrdom in the early church, there were more in the 20th century than the early early church. In fact, when I was in Rome, um, there's a, the, the PIME, the Pontifical Institute of Foreign Missions, have a room dedicated to their martyrs. And the China section is enormous. And, and the, the, one of the shirts that I recall was a, a bloodied white shirt from the priest who was killed in 1989. So, um, because he was Catholic. So the church in China after Ricci has some moments of severe persecution and moments where it was accepted. And when the, when the emperors needed um, people to take care of their calendar and make astronomical predictions um, and paint their portraits, like the Jesuit Giuseppe Castiglione, when the emperor wanted the Jesuits, somehow the whole church in China had a, had a moment of prosperity. When the emperor really didn't want the, the Jesuit presence in the, in, the, in the Forbidden City, then you would see more persecution in the church. And you have to also note that um, the, all the Qing emperors were Tibetan Buddhists. So um, in 1900, when uh, the Boxer Uprising was happening, and few people will know this, by the way, the, not just the Boxers were attacking the Catholics, but one of the most, the largest groups who were attacking Catholics and killing them in 1900 were actually Tibetan lamas. So you can read about this in journals. So long story short, you have a series of persecution and, and, and moments of persecution and moments of, of, of acceptance after Ricci. But everyone, I don't think I know one moment in history where I see at a document by an official or an emperor wherein um, Ricci is hated. Ricci was sort of exempt from criticism in China and still is. Um, he still is. That's a wonderful question. Yeah. I think we've got a feel for what is, how he addressed Confucianism. Pretty well. Mm -hmm. but I was wondering, you mentioned just very briefly the uh, doubt, and then I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on, on how he approached, you know, as he approached Confucianism and, and things like that, how did he approach doubt? Okay, that's a, that's a terrific question. See, the, I don't, this is how Ricci should be praised. Ricci wasn't going to be satisfied with being told what Taoism is. Ricci would only be satisfied if he, if he could read the text itself, right? So rumors are out of the question. He was a good Jesuit. Give me the text. Let me read the text. Let me read Aristotle. Let me read the Taoist, the Taoist text. So in the very beginning of the Tao Te Ching, right, at least there's so many editions of the Tao Te Ching, but the one that Ricci read was the Han Dynasty version of the Tao Te Ching. 
And it begins with this line. Now, I answer this question this way. It begins with this line. Dao ke dao, fei chang dao, ming ke ming, fei chang ming. It's always translated in the way that can be spoken of is not the constant way, and the name that can be named is not the constant name. Actually, that's not it. You can only understand that if you read Chinese, because it's a complete play. It, it reads something like the Tao that can be Taoed, because you can take a, a word and verbalize it or nominalize it. So the Tao that can be Taoed is not the constant Tao. And Ricci, reading it in its original language, getting the linguistic nuances, was able to discern the fact that what Taoism is basically arguing is that the reason that the Taoist way cannot be weighed or understood is because the way of Taoism must include the way and the unway. It must include the truth and the untruth. That is, there can be no ultimate anything in Taoism. Ricci understood the, the, the linguistic and intellectual pro problems with Taoism, which is why it was so popular with Buddhists. Because Buddhists were trying to argue that languages, you can't rely on language, you can't rely on truth paradigms, everything is really a construction. If you think one thing, there has to be its opposite. So long story short, Ricci's view of Taoism was that it's not logical, that, that it's just a linguistic tool. It's like, it's like intellectual acrobatics. It doesn't get us anywhere. So Ricci was able very quickly by studying the text to just say, Taoism, set it aside. I get it. But that's just not going to get us anywhere. And whereas the Taoists and the Buddhists are saying there's no reality, Ricci is along with the Confucius, the Confucian is saying, well, you say there's no reality. How do you know you're not paying attention to it? You see, his retort was, I'm here, I see the podium. Um, and if you want to deny this, then you're almost dismissible. So he very much engaged Taoism in as much as he wanted to find it was useful, and he found it wasn't useful. So Confucianism was sort of his Aristotle. Does that sort of answer that?